Um, but it's uh, basically it occurred to me that um, some phylogenetic methods, if not all of them, have a problem in the sense that they are not future proof. And I just decided to give a summary talk on that. So um, the projects are with different co authors. So um, I will always mention which project is with which co author, but um, uh, we have um, joint work with Andrew Francis, Michael Hendrickson, and Christina uh, Wicke um, covered by my talk. Okay. Um, Hang on. Oh, yeah, no. Okay. So what does that even mean? Future what? What does future proof even mean? Well, the term in the context of phylogenetics was first coined in 2017, I think, by David Bryant, Andrew Francis, and Mike Steele, who wrote a paper about uh, whether or not we can future proof consensus trees. And um, what did they mean with that? I mean, if you are not a native speaker, you might first misunderstand the word maybe, because um, according to the official Merriam-Webster dictionary, proof as an adjective means able to resist or repel, um, like in windproof or waterproof. So does this mean they wanted to repel the future? No, of course not. Um, what they wanted was to understand if consensus methods are prepared for future species discoveries. And we will see what they precisely um, want to check a little bit later um, in my talk. Okay, um, so why would we need future proof methods? This is maybe kind of a philosophical question, right? Um, but I had to think of my daughter. This is my daughter last year when she started primary school with a school pack um, at her feet and the traditional German uh, school start cone filled with uh, sweets and goodies. And um, what do we tell our children like all the time? Well, something that they said, there's a Latin proverb that's non spole sed vitae dissimus, which, uh, which translated, roughly translated means we don't just learn for school, we learn for life. And shouldn't this also uh, be true for our methods? And if I ask that, well, you can say, well, how can uh, things that we find out even be true if we all the time, of course, um, um, find, find new facts and, um, and discover new things. Of course, um, research results will always change, right? And I, I don't argue that. I don't say we should be like overly conservative, but um, we at least need reliable methods. And ideally, results should remain valid even when new data is discovered, at least um, if your new data does not explicitly prove previous findings wrong, or if your new data is completely unrelated to your previous findings. Um, so in some sense, I would even say, and as I said, this is maybe a philosophical point of view, that this is even necessary to justify what we are doing, because we want to reconstruct the true relationships between species uh, in phylogenetics. That's what it's all about, not just an interim estimate that's maybe only valid for like five years or something. We want to find out the true relationships, so we don't want that to be destroyed just because um, some new species is discovered next year or so. Okay, so I decided to give you three examples of um, how um, some methods are future proof and some are not. And the first um, aspect of future proving is a big part of phylogenetics that's um, concerned with reconstructing trees from like DNA or RNA or protein data. And um, the topic here, as I said, this is a slightly old result that um, I, I call the topic non-heredity of maximum parsimony. And I'll give you a rough overview of what that is about and what that has to do with future proving methods. So if you have a DNA alignment um, and you want to find the best evolutionary tree with regards to some optimization criterion, so you want the tree which somehow explains or represents your data best. And for instance, in this example with human, chimp, gorilla, and orangutan, you might wonder if the human should be grouped to the chimp or to the orangutan or to the gorilla. So you, that's the question. And you want to find out about that. And the maybe simple, uh, because it's a pure uh, method, because it's purely combinatorial, is maximum parsimony, which of course most of you know. So I will just briefly remind you. Um, of what that is. So by the way, do you guys see my cursor? If I move the, the cursor here? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah? Okay, okay. Yes. okay then, then I can point. That's good. I didn't know that. Okay, so um, 
Yeah, so, so what uh, parsimony does is basically for each site, so for each column in your alignment, uh, you need to check all so-called extensions. You, so you map your character um, onto the leaves of your, of your tree. So here you have species one and two, both in state A, which is represented here, and three and four in state C. And if you have this tree, for instance, and you want to, um, to find out the parsimony score of this site or of this character, it's also called on this tree, um, you need to check in a naive approach. We all know there are better ways, like pitch algorithm and so on, but I don't want to go into the details. The definition basically says you need to check all extensions. And um, an extension just means you have to assign um, possible ancestral states to these um, ancestral species here, and you have to check how many changes there are in the tree then. So for instance, here um, in this setting, why does my cursor not work? Okay, so if I had C here and C there and A here, I would definitely need a change from C to A here on this edge, but here from A to A not, from A to A not, and here C to C, C to C, C to C. So in total, I would have one change. Okay, but of course, I, as I said, I need to check all extensions. So I might as well have decided to, uh, to check this extension. Doesn't make much sense to have a T here if I have A and C here, but anyway, um, let's check this. Then of course, we need three changes here from C to C not, but we have C to T, T to C, T to A, and so on. So here we have in total three changes. So you have to check all extensions and the um, minimal number of changes given by any of these extensions is then the parsimony score of your character. Um, so this is for the definition. We all know you can calculate this more efficiently, but this is not my point. And then um, there's one important thing that I need um, for my one of my next slides. Um, you, if you have something like what we've seen first, that you can realize this here, if you have a C here, that you can realize this with one change, and it's a character that has two letter, uh, two uh, yeah, nucleotides or two states, namely A and C, then we call this a homoplasy free or convex character. So if the number of um, states uh, employed by your character minus one is e equals the parsimony score, then this is best possible. And the best possible case is called homoplasy free or, or convex. It's best possible because if you have for instance, two states, and one of them can be the root state, but the other one has to evolve at some stage. So you need at least one change from C to A or A to C. This is obvious. Or if you here have a, for instance, F3 has three states, C, A, and G. So it's pretty clear that you at least need two changes, no matter on which tree. And if you then, of course, you want to look at the whole alignment and not just one, uh, one column of it. So the score of the alignment is just the sum of all these side scores. That's pretty easy. And um, a tree with minimal score is then a maximum parsimony tree. So basically, you would have to, as again, in a naive way, you just have to look at all possible trees. Of course, that's uh, not really a, a possible in an efficient way. But if you look at all possible trees and you find the maximum parsimony score in that way, then you can take the tree that gives you the minimal score, and this is your maximum parsimony tree. So roughly speaking, it's just the tree that allows you to represent your alignment with the fewest possible number of changes. Okay, and um, the question that I was then looking at is a question that was um, actually many years ago asked by Arndt von Heseler um, from um, the Center of, for Integrative um, Bioinformatics in Vienna, in Austria. Um, he basically said, okay, assume you have an alignment S with the maximum parsimony tree T on some leaf set with N leaves. Is it then true that for all K from four up to N minus one, there is a subtree T prime of size K such that T prime is an MP tree for the restriction of S on the corresponding subset of taxa. Oh my God, that sounds pretty technical. So um, let me just show you an example of what he really means. So we have um, here an example of an alignment and it's unique in this case, unique maximum parsimony tree. And you can actually easily verify this because for instance, the first column wants one and two together and versus the rest, and this, of course, corresponds to this edge here. The second one wants three and four together. That's this edge here. 
And the last one wants five and six together, that's this edge here. So you can easily verify that every, um, of the every one of these characters and they are two states characters they all just require one change namely on the on the set edges um so they are all homoplasy free on this tree um, and as i said this is best possible for two state characters you will always need at least one change so there cannot be a better tree and it's why you can easily show that there's also no other tree with the same score so this is the unique um maximum parsimony tree for this alignment now what happens because what Arndt now asked is what happens if we delete species from the alignment? So if we now decide, for instance, to delete species number three, so I just deleted line number three, then I get this alignment. And now I basically redo my maximum parsimony analysis. I recalculate for this alignment a maximum parsimony tree. It happens to be this one in this case. I will later explain why that is not a coincidence. And this one, is a, my cursor keeps disappearing. This is a subtree of this tree. We could have given get we could have derived this tree by deleting leaf number three from this tree. We still have the cherry one two. We still have the cherry five six. We have four in the middle between them. So this here is just a nicer way of drawing this tree when leaf three gets deleted. And Arne's question is if that's always possible. Can I when I decide to delete a row from my alignment? always just delete the corresponding leaf from my maximum parsimony tree, yes or no. Would be nice if I could. And I will later on explain why it would actually be, um, yeah, also maybe <laughs> biologically important <laughs> uh, to be able to do that, um, but we will see that there's some negative news. But let's continue here. Um, Arndt said up to, uh, starting from size four, we, we have here now five taxa. So if we now delete, oops, oof. Oh. If we now delete taxon six, for instance, we derive a four taxon subtree. Again, this is a subtree of this one. I just deleted six here from, the, from this tree. Then I have to cherry one, two, and then four and five are most closely related. And I also here just deleted line number six. But um, this, this tree, again, is the unique maximum parsimony tree for this alignment. So in this sense, this is, this is Arndt's conjecture that you can always do this that you can take your alignment and delete some line and at the same time delete the corresponding leaf from the parsimony tree. And this will give you a parsimony tree for the sub alignment. And um, this also means you can basically look at this the other way around. Um, and that is why it's, I think that is why he termed this conjecture, the, uh, qu the question was called whether or not parsimony is hereditary, because you can basically think that this big tree inherited the property of being a maximum parsimony tree for this alignment from the smaller subtrees as they keep growing, so to speak. And of course, this immediately, if you look at it, means that this has something to do with future proving your methods. Because in this example, imagine that you have started off with this vortex on tree, and um, at some it had species one, two, four, and five, and at some stage you discovered species six. And you added it to the tree somewhere where it fits according to the DNA sequence that you've just added from your new species. Um, and then the tree did not change other than, of course, you have to find a location where to add species number six, but you did not mess around with the relationships between one, two, four, and five. So this is a nice property to have. And in this case, we have it. And this is not just a single example where this works. This works actually because this is a homoplasy free alignment, as I said in the beginning. Um, and for homoplasy free alignments, I can prove that the maximum parsimony property is indeed hereditary. And in this sense, then also, yes, then it is also future proof. If you discover a new species and you keep your alignment um, homoplasy free, then you have a future proof setting. Then your um, relationships that you have estimated before in the first step will never be messed with. Okay. That was a good example. So homoplasy free data is good, just not very realistic in real life. Um, but let's look at another positive example. As I said here in the title already, five taxon trees can be quite um, well behaved, um, namely if you have binary uh, data. So not for DNA data where you have four states, but if you just have say zero and one or A and B, um, so just some binary um, data where you just basically, basically look if, um, species has a property, yes or no, that would give you a typical 
binary um, alignment, maybe from morphological data or something. And then um, if you only really have five taxa, so you have such a tree, then there is always, um, then for the corresponding subalignment, there's always um, the, uh, yeah, the four taxon subtree that corresponds to the subalignment is then also always a maximum parsimony tree. This is something um, I can prove. Um, but I mean, five taxa is not much, and binary data is not really what we uh, are most interested in. And um, yeah, and with uh, more states or more taxa, this um, unfortunately um, fails. Yeah, but that we will see in a minute. So here's again a summary of the five taxon case. So if you have this tree and you find out that it's most parsimonious for your data, then this tree will also be most parsimonious. So for five taxon trees and binary data, yes. The maximum parsimony property is hereditary and in the sense also future proof. But here's a binary alignment and it only has one taxon more, namely six, uh, it has six uh, taxa. And of course, this is too long now to check it, but I can assure you that this tree here is the unique maximum parsimony tree. So in this case, it's unique. That's not always the case, but that in this case, this is true. So this is really strong support for this tree. But um, this tree happens to have no five taxon maximum parsimony subtree. So no matter which line of my alignment I decide to delete and calculate the maximum, recalculate the maximum parsimony tree, whatever I get as an output is not a subtree of this original tree. And it, does, it also has no four taxon maximum parsimony subtree. So it basically comes out of the blue. It is not supported by any of the sub alignments, it's, but it's very strongly supported when you take all taxa into account at the same time. So um, the discovery of new taxa can change the reconstructed relationships of the other taxa. I don't know if this, I mean, this is a bit uh, my mathematical example, you know, with one, two, three, and four, I wanted to show you um, in a bit more in a graphic detail, if you wish, what this implies. And that's why I asked my daughter to kindly provide some uh, very nice um, figures here some sketches of species. So say you have reconstructed this tree from your data. You have found out that the humans go with a group with the chimps and the orangut orangutans are a bit further away in the tree. And now you decide, or you, I don't, I don't know, you wouldn't really discover the mouse. The mouse has already been discovered, of course, but that's now my example. You discover a new species or you decide to um, include a new species into your analysis. And in this case, it's the mouse. And what you would expect is, well, yeah, you hang it somewhere in your tree, but it should not really change the relationships that you have already discovered. But this might not be what's actually happening. In fact, it might happen that the addition of a new species changes the relationships of the species you, that you already had discovered. But you would wonder, like, this is not biologically plausible. Why should this happen? Why should this be justified, right? I mean, um, yeah, the relationships between these three species have not changed, whether or not you consider the mouse. And this is not only an issue with future proving, as you all know, biologists like to add species they are not interested in into their analysis as an outgroup, because the outgroup helps them to, uh, to root their tree, because parsimony or other methods um, often only return unrooted trees. So they on, like, on purpose decide to add more species so that they learn more about the relationships of the species they're actually interested in, but they are unaware of the fact, or often they are unaware of the fact that this might alter the, uh, re the relationships of the species that they are actually interested in. It does not only give them the root position, it might change the entire tree. Okay, so the answer to Anne's question is no, maximum parsimony is not hereditary in general, and it's not future proof. Um, and if you now say, okay, this might just be true because maximum parsimony is a really simplistic method. It's only combinatorial. It does not have an underlying DNA substitution model and so on. And you are right about that. There's a lot of, there are a lot of negative things to say about parsimony, um, but it's not true that this is only a problem of parsimony. Um, and a very easy way to say, to see that is um, if you uh, remember the study of um, the 1997 classic paper by Mike Steele and Chris Tuffley, who looked at uh, maximum likelihood in comparison to maximum parsimony under the Jukes-Cantor model. And again, my cursor is gone. 
Um, I don't want to go into the details here, but this is just a standard and, and very simple um, DNA um, evolution model or nucleotide um, substitution model. And they found out that under this model with the, an additional assumption of no common mechanism, which I also will not explain in my talk, but um, this is just, you know, sort of artificial and a very, very strong um, um, yeah, additional assumption. And I'm not saying this is in any way a realistic model, but it says that you can choose um, model parameters such that um, maximum parsimony and maximum likelihood will be equivalent in the sense that they choose the same tree or the same set of trees if, if the tree is not unique. So, there are, so maximum likelihood as opposed to parsimony depends on an evolutionary model. And there are models for instance, this one where likelihood will also then not be hereditary or not be future proof because it does the same nonsense that parsimony does. This is basically what this theorem is saying. And um, so my conclusion here is maximum parsimony is not hereditary and thus not future proof and neither is likelihood. Of course, this is depending on the model. I'm not saying this is true for all models, but you cannot in general say likelihood as a method is, um, is future proof. That would not be correct. Okay, so there's a problem, okay? We, we, uh, we must think about things, not only about things like using outgroups, but also about things like, will our reconstructed tree still be valid if we discover a new species? This is, this is actually, I find that quite um, disturbing to think that the mouse, whether or not I consider the mouse, can um, change something about the relationships between human and chimps that I would estimate. Okay. That was my first example, already quite dramatic. Um, but then, uh, as I promised, I will uh, briefly look um, at consensus methods as well, because that is basically um, was the topic that um, David, Andrew, and Mike looked at when they decided to look at future proving um, methods, and they decided to look at consensus methods. Um, my project and consensus method, methods is joint work with Michael Hendrickson, and we were basically extending the study by, um, by Andrew, uh, David, and Mike a little bit. I will explain that in a minute. So what is a consensus method? It's basically a different problem than before. Before, we were concerned with one of the main topics of phylogenetics, namely reconstructing trees from data. Um, but of course, if you do that a lot, you might end up with a lot of different trees for, for instance, for the same date for the same taxon set, because my, you might have looked at different genes. Um, so you want a consensus method um, because you might have a collection of trees. You might have looked at different genes uh, and they gave you different trees for the same set of species, or you might have used different methods. Your likelihood tree might not have agreed with your parsimony tree or something. So you, you end up or you have you've just asked different people and they have different opinions of, on the relationships or something of these species. So you have a bunch of trees for the same set of species. And um, what you want is a unique tree. So you sort of want to find a summary, you want to find a consensus of your input trees, you want to know, so, sort of summarize the, um, the, the information that's basically there. And in, I will just say, talk about consensus, consensus method five. It's just, uh, I will call, it, that's when I have the general word. Um, normally, um, when I want a specific one, I will, which I will tell you about later, I will, of course, tell you their names. So a consensus tree, in this sense, if you have a profile of trees, that is just um, an ordered tuple of K trees, um, then the, you, the uh, consensus tree is phi of P. If the profile is P, then phi of P. Okay, so for instance, you might have two input trees and you basically want to summarize them to give you some sort of output tree that in some way summarizes some things, some aspects of the underlying trees. And you can do, do that um, for, uh, for rooted trees as in this picture here, but you can also do this, of course, for unrooted trees. But how would you do this? How can you summarize um, uh, why, why do we need it? I already said it. You might have many trees from Bayesian tree estimation. Um, you have looked at different genes or you have different tree reconstruction methods, et cetera, et cetera. So there are just many instances in phylogenetics where you have multiple trees and you want to combine them into one unique tree. With Bayesian tree estimation, these MCMC methods is actually in interesting because we call them tree estimation methods, but that's not at all what they are. What they are is they give you um, a probability distribution on the tree space, 
And um, then you, what you still need, if you want to use it as a tree estimation method, so you want the biologist comes and wants to use Bayesian methods to find um, the best tree, then you still, I mean, then you give him a distribution. That's not what he asked for. He wants one tree. So you still need to use the consensus method to sort of get the like average tree, if you wish. Okay, so what uh, exactly is a consensus method? So for my talk, a consensus method is a function that assigns a unique phylogenetic tree um, phi of p to each profile p of possible phylogenetic input trees on the same taxon set, which I call x in this case. OK. Um, OK, and there, which consensus methods do we know? How would you do that? There was the simplest way and maybe also the most conservative way is the strict consensus. So if you have a profile of um, such trees, you can define the strict consensus to be the unique tree which contains only clusters contained in all input trees. And uh, as you might imagine, these are sometimes not many. Sometimes, um, yeah, sometimes the the um, yeah, there's no cluster that's contained in all input trees. So the information contained in the strict consensus is actually normally not that much. But um, of course, if on the other hand, if you have a cluster um, that is contained in all input trees, then of course um, it is quite uh, it is quite strongly supported. So then it's, it makes sense to contain it um, in the consensus. So that that um, on the other hand really makes sense. Um, I forgot to mention actually because I now use the word clusters that all our findings, everything that Michael and I did, we did it twice. We did it for rooted and for unrooted trees. So everything that I say now about like clusters is a typical term from rooted trees, but you could as well talk about splits here that would still remain valid. Okay, so that is the first thing and I'll show you an example in a minute. But before I do that, let's briefly look at loose consensus. Loose consensus, um, basically um, assigns the unique tree um, which contains only clusters contain, contained in at least one of the input trees and which are compatible with all of the trees. So basically it must be there at least once and it cannot be contradicted by any other tree. That would be loose consensus. Also makes sense when you, when you hear that. Um, and the um, last example that I want to show you for now is majority rule. For majority rule, you need to give a percentage, which is um, at least uh, 50%. And um, then the majority rule tree with respect to this number P is the unique tree, which contains only clusters contained in more than P percent. That's important if you choose 50 here, um, because exactly 50 doesn't work, then you might still have um, like in one half of your data set, you, uh, of your tree set, you might have one split and in the other half, a contradicting split that that would not be okay. So, um, but um, yeah, you want more than uh, p percent. Except if p is already chosen to be a hundred, then you can't have more. Then equal equality is enough. Um, yeah. So if you have um, if you have a cluster contained in more than p percent, and usually you take fifty. So if you have it in more than half of your trees, then you would uh, take it um, to build your um, consensus tree. Um, please note that if you take p equal to 100, this is just the same as taking the strict consensus because then you would want it in 100% of your input trees. So you would want it in all your input trees, just what strict consensus wanted. Okay, but typically majority rule, when we talk about majority rule, we typically are looking at um, p equal to 50. Okay, so let us compare these methods. Um, Let's consider this input profile here. Um, I have seven um, species, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And I have these three um, different trees, but they are not all that different. They have some things in common. Now let's look what the consensus would be. If I look at the strict consensus, for instance, I can only have clusters that are contained in all the input trees. And you can see, for instance, the cherry one, two is here. It's also here, and it's also here. So the cherry one, two needs to be in the strict consensus. However, there's no other cluster that is contained in all of them. For instance, the cherry three, four is here, is also here, but this is not here, right? It's, um, this is not a cherry three, four. So yeah, so there are no, you can look them through. There's no other cluster that is contained in all of these trees. Okay, so the strict consensus, as I said, doesn't contain all that much information. It just tells you 
that species one and two are most closely related, but we can't say anything about their relationship to any of the other species. It, this might really not be all that satisfactory. So what would loose consensus say? Loose consensus would add all clusters that are present at least once and not contradicted by any of the others. So for instance, um, yeah, for instance, what do we have? One and two is clear that is even present in all that we have already checked. So everything that's in the strict consensus, of course, also must be in the loose consensus. But what about three and four? Well, this was present here and there. It's not present here, but it's also not contradicted here, right? We don't know if three and four should go together or three and five, maybe. So this is a, a cluster with um, this unresolved. So it does not contradict the cherry three, four. So, okay, yes, we can take this. And um, the six and seven, the same point, we have it here and here and here, it's just in a, contained in a bigger cluster. So it's not contradicted. So this is the loose consensus. Already a lot more information. And if we take the majority rule consensus with uh, P equal to 50%, then we get yet another tree. Again, we need the cherry one, two that's present in all trees. So it's even present in 100% of trees. So definitely more in, than in 50%. But for instance, the cherry three, four is uh, in, here present in two out of three trees. So two thirds is also more than 50%. So the cherry three, four needs to be here. The cherry six, seven, the same, it's present in two out of three. But this, this cluster here is maybe a little bit interesting, a little bit more interesting because um, you have um, the cluster, um, yeah, three, four, five. So this edge here, why can you, why can you also, um, we have already said the cherry three, four must be here, but why is this cluster here? Because this cluster is basically here, you can on this edge cut off three, four, and five, and you can, have it here on this edge. So we also have this cluster in two out of three trees. So this is a little bit more resolved here. So we have three consensus methods and three different trees here. Um, yeah, so this is quite interesting. So they are quite uh, different methods really. Um, so if there are so many different methods, you might wonder when is a consensus method actually sensible? When is it biologically plausible? And this um, led uh, Andrew, David and Mike to the to the notion of regular consensus methods. So they basically termed three properties that you might wish for. The first is unanimity. So if your input profile only contains of like different copies of the same tree, then of course the consensus should equal that tree. It wouldn't make sense if all your uh, input trees agree 100%, um, why should the consensus be something else? That wouldn't make sense. So you would want the consensus tree to be this tree then. Another property you might wish for is anonymity. So if you change the order of trees in P, if you have trees T1 to TK, and then you decide to whatever, um, order them from TK to T1 or something, you would want uh, the consensus to remain unchanged. So basically this means that instead of considering ordered tuples, you want to be able to look at this like at, um, in terms of a multi-set. It's, multi, it's not a set because you can have uh, multiple copies of the same tree, but um, you basically just wonder, you know, how which tree is there, how often, and so on. You don't want to wonder in which order um, they came. Okay, and you want neutrality. That means if you change the, the labels of the leaves, um, that this should simply swap the leaves in the consensus tree in the same way. Right, just because you swap the roles of, let's say, taxon one and two, doesn't mean that your tree should uh, change completely. It just means, yeah, well, the roles in, of one and two should be swapped. Nothing else should really happen. Everything else would not be plausible. So, um, a consensus method fulfilling these three properties. This is what um, what David, uh, Andrew, and Mike called a regular consensus method. And it turns out that. Um, yeah, strict consensus, loose consensus, and majority rule consensus are all regular. So it's not, not hard to fulfill, fulfill these properties. Or at least our uh, methods that are frequently used for consensus, they all fulfill this property. Okay, so, but the question now was, of course, and that was the topic of their paper, which of these regular consensus methods, um, so which of these biologically plausible consensus methods are actually future proof. And um, so that what they meant is which consensus methods 
are robust, robust concerning the introduction of new information. And what they explicitly meant is um, about, um, ah, yeah, okay. So in general, new information means if you gain more insight, this should refine your knowledge about the consensus, but not contradict your previous findings. And what they meant is they want, wanted to look at extension stability. So they wanted to know if they can introduce new taxa without, so, so to speak, disturbing the entire consensus tree. So this basically um, is equivalent to discovering new species or including new species in your analysis. This is what they called extension stability. And it turned out, so what does it mean? A consensus method is called extension stable if for every profile P of phylogenetic X trees and for every um, subset Y of your text. Hello, what? Simone, I just, what did you say? I didn't say anything. I think it's all fine. Just, just okay, okay, okay. So, um, so for every, so you have, if for every profile P of phylogenetic X trees and for every subset Y of your species or taxon set X, we have that the um, consensus tree that you estimate if you look at your profile restricted to the subset of taxa, if that is, um, so to speak, um, or if, if the, I mean, let, let me say this the other way around. So if the consensus tree that you get when you um, look at pi, at P, at the whole profile, and then restrict it to this subset of taxa Y, if this is basically refining your, um, your uh, consensus tree uh, that you would get if you look at the restricted um, input trees. So, um, but it turns out, yeah, so this, this would mean that you could add more taxa and all that would happen is um, if you, if you um, add more taxa, all that would happen is that your consensus would maybe be refined. So you might, might have um, like new clusters that you didn't know before or so, but you wouldn't have any completely um, um, contradicting clusters, not, nothing that is completely changed. Um, but unfortunately, no regular consensus methods uh, are extension, uh, no regular consensus method is extension stable on all possible profiles. So this is really, really radically bad news um, for consensus methods. So discovering new species is really, really bad because this is not only about um, the, the three consensus methods that I've just told you about, this is about all consensus methods. There are no regular consensus methods that are extension stable on all possible profiles. Okay. Um, but the, the authors, to be fair, they also showed some positive results on restricted versions of extension stability, but I don't want to go into the detail here. So I want to go back to their original question. The original question was, which consensus methods are actually robust concerning the introduction of new information? And new information does not have to mean new species discovery or so. It can also mean something else. So, um, so what I and Michael have been looking at was not extension stability, but refinement stability. So what happens if you sort of gain more knowledge on formerly unresolved clusters? So you just, like we had it before, we had three, four, and five together, but we didn't really know if it should be three and four versus five or so on. So if you gain a little bit more insight on your input trees, but you don't radically change them, you just resolve them a little bit more, um, does this then mess around with your consensus tree? Um, yes or no? And uh, so what does it formally mean, refinement stability? Well, if we have a consensus method um, and if for any pair of profiles, um, P and P prime, where we basically choose P prime to consist of the same trees, but refined. So they refined can also mean, I mean, this is basically, um, they are allowed to be the same. So it can be that some of them are unchanged um, or maybe even all of them, then it would be uh, the trivial case. But um, if you change something from P to P prime, then the tr it's just that you give a little bit more information. You add new clusters to your tree, but you don't um, take any clusters away or put in anything that uh, contradicts the, the trees here. So the trees in t, t, the T is Ti prime that are in P prime are just um, refined versions of the tree trees Ti in uh, P. Um, then we have also that the consensus tree of P prime is a refined version of the consensus tree of P. 
So in other words, if you refine your input trees, you gain a little bit more information on them, then you maybe also gain a little bit more information on the consensus tree. You might add new clusters to that as well, but you will not radically change that. If this is the case for your consensus method for any possible such pair of um, input profiles, then we call this method refinement stable. Okay, so which methods are refinement stable? Well, um, the good thing is that Michael and I uh, can prove that majority rule and strict consensus, which are two of the most frequently used uh, consensus methods, are refinement stable. This is pretty good news because in this sense, they are also future proof, right? If you, if you, add, if you like, gain more insight, um, basically this does, not, uh, this does not mess with your previous findings. Um, loose consensus, on the other hand, is not refinement stable. And I can show you why. Let's look at this really simple um, input profile consisting of two trees. The first one is super boring because it has basically no information. It just says that our five species here are related. It's the star tree. There's no cluster known here. And the second input tree has only one um, non-trivial cluster, which is the cherry one, two. So if we, for this input profile, construct the loose consensus, um, as I said before, it would take all clusters that are present in at least one of them. So the only candidate here is the cherry one, two, must be present in at least one and cannot be contradicted by any other tree. But well, this one doesn't have any um, non-trivial clusters. So in particular, none that would contradict putting one and two together. So the loose consensus is just the second tree here. Okay, but what if I now instead looked at this profile? P prime. So I haven't changed this tree, but I have changed this. I don't look at this um, star tree anymore. Instead, I look at this tree. And here I can see that the loose consensus is the star tree because I have only two clusters that are candidates for being added to my consensus, namely the cherry one, two and the cherry two, three. But of course, they contradict each other because um, this one says one, uh, two should be most closely related to one and three is further away. Whereas this says two should be most closely related, related to three and the one is further away. So these, the only two candidates that might be contained in a loose consensus are contradicting each other. So they can't be contained in the loose consensus. So there's nothing contained here, no non-trivial cluster. So, um, and what, what does that mean? Why is this now a counter example? Well, because this tree here is a refined version, of course, of the star tree, right? I have, all I've done is I've taken the star tree and added one more cluster. Well, and this tree here has not changed. So this is a refinement of itself. So P prime is a refinement of P. And uh, the consensus on the other hand is not a refinement of this one. This one is, uh, is sort of, is the refined version. This one is the coarser tree. So when we refined our input trees, we lost information on, in the consensus rather than gain more. So this is basically what is an example for like to show that this is not refinement stable. Okay, so what about other consensus methods? I don't want to go into the details here, but for instance, of course, you can use super tree methods like matrix representation with parsimony and matrix representation with compatibility, MRP and MRC as consensus methods. The difference is super tree methods are normally made for summarizing the information given by several input trees that do not have to agree on the taxon set. So normally you use super tree methods to build, like you have uh, some small taxon sets and for them you have your trees and then you want to build one big tree that summarizes them all. But of course these methods also work if you um, have input trees on the same uh, species set. So you, so you can cheat and use them as consensus methods. But the, the problem is they don't necessarily lead to a unique output tree. So if you then have a set of super trees, you, you again need to summarize the set. So that's why I say you have to cheat because you need, in order to make them work, um, MRP and MRC, if they return a set of super trees, then you need to um, use another consensus tree, like for instance, uh, strict consensus or so, to summarize their output. So in order to turn that, such super tree methods into consensus methods, you already need a pre-existing consensus method to use on top of the super tree method. That's why it's a little bit um, 
dubious and not all authors agree that these are actually valid, super, uh, valid consensus methods. But you can regard them as consensus methods. And um, yeah, but they are not refinement stable. Okay, this is a bit um, technical to show, but uh, they are not refinement stable. And neither are other famous consensus methods like Adams consensus or AHO's consensus. I don't want to go into the details here, but they are also not refinement stable. So that might, but remember what we, what we found, our first finding was that majority rule and strict consensus are refinement stable. So what we actually were looking at was whether this makes these methods unique, whether or not this is special. Is this a special property? Is being refinement stable something that sort of um, characterizes majority rule? I mean, strict consensus is just a special case of majority rule. So we wanted to know, does this characterize majority rule? And it turns out, uh, so no, they are not the only ones that are regular and refinement stable. In fact, there are infinitely many regular and refinement stable consensus methods. I'm not saying that they are in any case biologically plausible, but we could construct a class of, um, of ex examples of uh, such methods for which we can prove they are just made up hypothetical mathematical uh, methods, but we can prove that they are all regular and refinement stable. So there are infinitely many of them. This by far shows that, um, like it shows that majority rule and strict consensus by far are not the only ones. Okay, so um, what is our conclusion concerning consensus methods? No, they are not in general future proof in the sense of extension stability. This is what uh, Mike, Andrew and uh, David sh uh, um, showed. So this, they are not um, future proof concerning the introduction of new taxa, like the discovery of new species or something. Um, they are future proof, at least majority rule and strict consensus in the sense of refinement stability. So just if you find out a little bit more information about clusters or splits, that is fine. So, um, but so are infinitely many hypothetical methods. I don't know if that's good or bad news, but you might be interested, you know, biologists might actually want to learn about some of these methods. Maybe there are some other interesting methods in this set of um, infinitely many, I don't know. Um, yeah, so this is, the, this is the summary on consensus methods. Is this um, now good news or bad news? I don't know. I'm still thinking that the result by David, Mike and, and uh, Andrew is really, really, really bad news. Um, I mean, this because this also applies to majority rule, right? It's not future proof concerning the introduction of new taxa. It is concerning refinement stability, but this is, you know, just, um, yeah, just a little benefit here, but I, we, we have no really future proof consensus methods in the sense that you can discover new species and your, your um, previous findings will still remain valid. So this was the sec my second example. And my newest example that I um, want to basically give you a short overview of is um, biodiversity conservation. So what have we looked at? We have looked at um, so far at tree reconstruction, which is a big um, task of, um, of my mathematical phylogenetics. Um, we have looked at summarizing different trees, which was the consensus methods, and we found a lot of bad news concerning future proving these, these things. But on the other hand, you might say, okay, we, we at least we, we haven't hurt anybody, right? I mean, to be honest, who really cares if my estimate on a phylogenetic tree is right or wrong? I mean, it might be annoying for me if it's after if after five years or so, I must say, okay, because just because we discovered a new a new taxon, a new species, um, all my previous relationships that I estimated um, are now dubious. This is of course not what we want as scientists, but who really cares? At least this does not have any other long-lasting negative effects. But what if we use our trees? in order to make decisions on biodiversity conservation? What if we use our trees in order to decide where we will um, invest our money or in, in which species protection we will invest our money? We don't have money to protect all species, so we must make some sort of decision. And um, well, what if these decisions go wrong? This has quite a long lasting effect. So at least such decisions, please, 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 should be future proof. So this is why um, Christina, Andrew, and I decided to look at this problem. Okay, and how are such decisions made? If you want to uh, decide which species to protect, 
Um, I mean, <laughs> historically, this often has been done based on what I call the cuteness factor, right? I mean, you want to protect dolphins because they are super, super cute and they are smart and I don't know, they always look like they are smiling, um, which they are not, but <laughs> many people think so. Um, and of course, like uh, other species like sharks are not that or not all that popular. So there's a lot of funding going into the protection of dolphins and not so much in going into the protection of sharks even though it might well be that they are more important for their ecosystem, the oceans, right? And um, so this is, of course, we hopefully all agree that this is um, not a good way to um, make such decisions. Just because we find the species cute doesn't mean it's in any regard important or so. So we want some more ob objective measures. And one criterion, not um, not necessarily um, like the only one, there are many criteria, but one criterion to support your conservation decisions is the so-called fair proportion index. Now, what does this do? If you have a rooted binary tree with root row and positive branch length lambda, which might be, you know, the evolutionary distance, like a number of substitutions that have, had a, have happened on that edge or something, um, the fair proportion index of a taxon X is defined by this equation. So um, what it does, it, um, it looks at the path in your tree T from the root to your species, uh, to your taxon X, um, that's of course unique in a tree. And you look at all the edges on this path and you take the length of uh, this edge and divide it by the number of leaves descending from this edge. So this is why it's called fair proportion because it like fairly apportions the, the, um, yeah, the genetic information of this edge um, between all the, its descendants. And then you of course sum that up for all Again, my cursor is gone. I don't know. You sum that up for all um, for all edges on this path. Okay. So let's look at this example. Uh, no worries. It's a bit big. I will not go through all the leaves here, but let's look at a simple case. Let's look at leaf X1. X1, basically um, the path from X1 to the root is uh, highlighted here. It only consists of two edges. And if you want to calculate the fair proportion index of X1, you need to take, of course, this first edge here. Um, it has length one. So you have to divide it, the number one, which is the edge length, by all the leaves that descend from this edge. So this is um, taxa x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, and x6. x6. So you divide it one, uh, it's one divided by six. So this is the contribution of this edge to the sum. And then the only other summoned comes from this edge here, but of course, um, so yeah, this edge uh, has only one descendant, namely x1, so this would be 61 divided by one. Don't, um, don't laugh about my number choices here. It's not drawn to scale either, right? I mean, this at length one looks pretty long compared to the 100, 119 here, but I need this example later on. But what is important now is that it's quite easy to calculate the fair proportion index. In summary here, this is uh, 61.17. And you can, of course, repeat the same calculation for all your taxa. And then you get such a table here, and as you can see, at least my um, leaf labels have been chosen nicely so that these uh, fair proportion in, in, uh, indices here are ranked. You can see X1 um, has the highest fair proportion index and X9 the lowest, okay? And um, yeah, so basically uh, X9 doesn't seem to be all that important if you think of the conservation of genetic information in the tree. In fact, if X9 went extinct, um, all that you would immediately lose is this edge of length one here, because um, this edge of length uh, 12 and this edge of length 119 are somehow also covered by X8. So yeah, it doesn't seem to be all that dramatic to lose X9 really. And um, this is basically the intuition here. Whereas if you lose X1, the edge of length uh, 61 will immediately be lost forever. So all information here is gone. So this, it makes sense intuitively that you would rank X1 higher than X9. Okay, so you can calculate this table and you can have a ranking and this ranking can be used um, to sort of uh, tell you which species is most important to cover uh, the, yeah, the ge like genetic information 
in the tree. And this might be one criterion to help you make the decision um, on which species you want to, you want to protect um, yeah, if you have limited funding. And um, the question here that um, we were actually looking at, Christina, Andrew and I, is the question of whether or not these rankings are future proof. What does that mean? Now, we were not so much looking, I mean, you could also ask that question like about like at the discovery of new species, we are looking at something that's basically uh, more realistically um, happening all, every day. We were looking at um, species going extinct. So if some of your species go extinct, are you convinced that you will still be happy with your conservation decisions, for instance, before? Here in this tree, I mean, clearly by far, X1 has the highest fair proportion index. So if you have limited fundings, then for sure, you will put a lot of money on X1 and possibly no money on X9. And now if one of these species go extinct, for instance, X9, the one you didn't care about in the first place, are you sure that you will in hindsight not regret that you put most of your funding in, into the conservation of species X1? That's a really good question, right? And um, yeah, I mean, thinking of um, future generations and of the impact that such decisions have, I pretty much think that uh, these decisions should be future proof. Um, yeah, so let's look at this tree again. Um, let's let's uh, choose these three species, X8, X3, and X6, to go extinct. I will later on explain to you why we chose these now, and this is just an example, right? So if these three species go extinct, they are gone. Then we get a tree T tilde, and we can do the same calculations as before. Again, we can recalculate the fair proportion indices. If I do this for X1, for instance, that we have seen before, uh, yeah, it's here the part, then um, you will see that this has changed a little bit because before we had here the sum of one divided by six plus 61 divided by one, and now it's one divided by four because um, this edge now only has four descending species because uh, out of the six, two uh, have gone extinct. So this has increased. So for some of them, the um, the um, fair proportion index will increase. And I have recalculated them all and summarized them here in the table. And now look at the table at that table. So for X3, X6, and X8, of course, you have nothing because they are extinct. But for all the others, yes, the importance, if you wish, of X1 has increased. The fair proportion index is higher, slightly higher, but it's now the one with the lowest fair proportion index, right? And the, the whole ordering, the entire ranking is uh, completely reversed. It's the other way around. Okay. Well, this must surely mean that Maraca has just chosen a really, really, really uh, bad example, right? This is just a lousy example. I mean, already during the time of my PhD, I was always the one coming up with really, really bad news with really lousy examples. So this must be something that I've just made up and this hardly ever happens, right? Well, unfortunately, no. Unfortunately, we can prove that every rooted binary tree, so no, it doesn't also, it does not depend on the tree shape. You, you give us a tree and we will tell you, we will tell you that uh, some branch lengths for that tree, such that there's a strict ranking, strict meaning there are no ties. You can really order them from most important to least important. Um, that gets completely reversed um, when one leaf per cherry, cherry gets deleted, okay? So this was actually not a coincidence that I had to um, choose here, one leaf per cherry to go extinct. So if I do this, then I can always um, construct such a lousy example. Okay, this is pretty bad because the entire ranking gets completely reverted. After this, these species have gone extinct here, you will find out that so far you've invested all your money in X1, which is now by far the least important species. This would be a huge conservation regret. Okay, well, I mean, how likely is it that one cherry per uh, one leaf per cherry gets extinct? Yeah. Well, well, okay, bad mathematical example. That probably doesn't happen. So, what if only? Um, yeah, so losing one leaf per cherry is bad. We believe that now, but maybe that won't happen. So what about a single leaf? 
What about um, if you just let one leaf go extinct, um, or you just delete one leaf from your tree, that can't possibly be, uh, be that bad. That can't change much, right? Um, but first of all, if you think of the tree shape, if you want something independent of a tree shape, then I'll tell you about that in a minute. But if you think of a caterpillar tree that only has one cherry, this single leaf, um, if you choose that to be the one, one of the leaves in your cherry, then you have the same lousy case as before, right? So, but that would be a statement depending of the, of your uh, tree shape, and we wanted to get rid of that. So, how, what, what is the impact of a single leaf? Um, well, it turns out it can have a, a huge impact. It can actually change much, even if it does not turn around um, the entire ranking in all cases. So let's look at this example here. I have a five taxon tree with some branch lengths. And um, what happens is if I calculate the fair proportion indices of species A to E, um, and now species A goes extinct. So species A disappears. That's why it also has no, um, no value here on the right-hand side of my table. Um, then what you see is I've not ordered them as nicely. I just noticed, okay, C has a, is higher here than D, but other than that, they are ordered. Um, but what you can see is that um, species B, which, which happened to be the second, uh, yeah, second lowest, yeah, so it's the second lowest in your ranking. You might not have put, if you have five species, maybe you have only money to, to uh, save three or so, you might have so far put all your efforts into C, D, and E, or maybe D and E. You might not have thought about B at all because it was the second lowest, right? But it's now the highest, just because species A, and that was the least important one. You've lost the least important one. You didn't even care about that. And now, but the, the loss of this species means that you have so far focused on the wrong species because the one that you haven't put any money in is suddenly the most important one. This is really bad news. And it is not, um, you know, not just a lousy example. So again, we can prove that for every rooted binary tree, there are branch lengths which have the property that deleting the leaf with the smallest fair proportion value turns the leaf with the second lowest one um, into the maximum. So that just what happened in this example. Okay, and additionally, I don't want to go into the details here, but we can also show that the extinction of the lowest ranked species can have the effect that up to roughly n minus uh, one divided by two um, species might require more urgent conservation attention than the species that was originally considered the most important one to conserve. So it, no one species going extinct does not change the entire ranking but it can uh, change the importance of more or less half the species under consideration. Okay, so the fair proportion index as a ranking criterion is not future proof. But why does that matter? Well, as I said before, this is actually an, an, a criterion that is being used. There is this EDGE program by the Zoological Society of London. They have a red list of threatened species. And of course, they also use other criteria, but one of them amongst others is the fair proportion index. Um, they call it, uh, I think, evolutionary distinctiveness or something. They have a different name for it, but mathematically it, it is the fair proportion index. And it is being used to make real conservation decisions. I find that scary. Um, and the, because con why do I find that scary? Because conservation decisions can be irreversible. Okay. And um, as, I, as I've just shown, these decisions are not future proof. They come with a lot of regrets if you um, make the wrong decisions. And as I said before, well, we want future proof methods in order to yeah, have results that are still valid for the next generation for people like my daughter. And um, if we sort of let important species go extinct that are like maybe important to save whole, yeah, a whole, uh, whole lot of information of the tree, um, yeah, then people like my daughter might at some stage tell us that we've, uh, that we've uh, basically made a whole lot of wrong decisions. And um, we would have to answer why we have used such non-future proof methods all the time. So I'm just, I just basically, I know this is somehow depressing and I know it's somewhat a philosophical question, um, but my conclusion is that most phylogenetic methods, and I've shown you only three different areas, 
I also have more. Also gene tree species tree reconciliation is actually not future proof. Um, there are other topics, other areas where we apply methods that are not future proof. And um, there are a few exceptions, of course. We have also seen some posit pos positive results. Homoplasy free alignments lead to future proof maximum parsimony trees. Um, majority rule and strict consensus are at least future proof concerning tree refinement. Um, but unfortunately not um, concerning uh, the introduction of new species and so on. But it's, there's no doubt that we need to find better methods, particularly in areas like biodiversity conservation. This is clearly overdue. You might not think that you do any harm if you, if you have a wrong parsimony tree. Of course not. But if you take the wrong index to, um, to make conservation decisions, then this is an issue that we should talk about. Yeah, with this, I want to thank all my co-authors. I also want to thank my daughter for the lovely illustrations. You all know that normally I have some cartoons in my talks, uh, but uh, the owners of these, now that this talk is online, you know, <laughs> the owners of these cartoons, they might sue me. My daughter promised not to sue me. She said she doesn't even charge me for the pictures. So I, I thought hers are better. This is why, um, yeah, I want to uh, conclude this talk with yet another figure um, that she drew that's actually older that she did like two years ago. And I just want to know if there are any questions. 